Welcome everybody to the uh, next part of our mathematical physics uh, seminar. Uh, as tradition uh, says uh, through the hybrid form uh, for, for today. And uh, we are very, very delighted that uh, uh, our invitation has been agreed uh, uh, by Ingmar, Ingmar Chaberi from uh, uh, University of Munich from Arnold uh, Sommerfeld Center of uh, Theoretical Physics, and uh, who is going to talk today about pure spinners and uh, Cauchy duality. So it's yours. Great. Thank you so much for the invitation and for the introduction. Um, I would have loved to be able to come to Prague in person. Um, I think the last time I was there was more than 10 years ago, very briefly. Um, and it was not for math, it was for a choir trip. So at some point I would love to come there for math, but um, we'll have to wait until things settle down. And it's a pleasure to be here with you all in hybrid form. Um, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about some sort of ways that I've been thinking about the pure spinner superfield formalism. And um, this sort of picture has been growing over time. I think I started thinking about this several years ago in a paper um, when I was in Heidelberg together with Johannes Fagher and Richard Eger. Um, and then recently we published another paper about this, which sort of um, cleared up some more questions that I had. And I think there will be at least one more paper in this series where I continue to fix mistakes that I've made and, and understand things hopefully better. Um, so I'm gonna give you kind of a perspective on what this formalism is about and why this might be an especially useful way to think about the problem of constructing super multiplets. Of course, that's an old problem and there are lots of different ways of doing it, um, but this is kind of my favorite and I'll, I'll give you some reasons why it ended up becoming my favorite. I was a little bit surprised by this too. Um, so maybe let me start with just a point of general philosophy. Um, so over time, um, we've started using things in physics such as the BRST and BV formalisms. So let me say the BRST. Um, have sort of pushed us Uh, towards a, what I'll call a derived way of understanding physics or field theories. Um, so what do I mean by this? Really, I mean, um, in the BRST formalism, for example, we sort of move from thinking about the space of fields as being just a space of physical fields to thinking about it as a space of fields where there are also ghosts involved. Um, there's a sort of grading, which is called ghost number in the physics literature. And we think about using the ghost fields to describe the operation of taking the quotient by gauge symmetries. Um, and so in that sense, the space of fields is now thought of as being a chain complex. There's a differential, which is the BRST differential. And that differential does the work of representing what might be some complicated nonlinear space of fields, actually, um, some quotient by gauge symmetries. Um, in the BRST formalism, we free ourselves up to think only about just fields and ghosts. Um, those are sort of linear spaces of fields but at the cost of including this differential, which represents all the complicated business that's going on. Um, and that's sort of a, an example of what I think of as being related to the perspective of derived geometry in math. It says that if you want to think about a complicated object, it's better to think about a chain complex of simple objects. Um, here I'm using simple in a really vague way, just sort of a day-to-day -day version of what simple means. 
Um, simple might, for example, mean three. So if I was talking about modules over some ring, um, I might have very complicated modules that are not free. Um, they don't have bases. Um, and the derived perspective says, well, it's sort of interesting to study those by replacing them by chain complexes of free modules where the differential encodes all of the interesting constraints or quotients or what have you. Um, if I do this, I have to think about introducing a notion of equivalence because there are many, many different chain complexes that have the same cohomology. Um, so I'll write that there are many models of the same theory or object, which I want to regard as all being equivalent. So for example, um, it's familiar, I think, to everybody who's thought a bit about BRST that I can include some number of BRST trivial pairs. Um, and those trivial pairs that consist of maybe one bosonic and one fermionic field and adjacent ghost numbers, the BRST differential simply maps one to the other. And so they don't contribute to the cohomology at all. Um, and I'm sort of forced to conclude that if I have pairs of fields that don't contribute to the cohomology in an interesting way, I can either include them or not. And so there are many, many different ways of representing equ an equivalent field theory via different models, where some models have more fields and a different BRST differential. Some have fewer, smaller BRST differential. Um, and for the purposes of the talk I'll give today, the idea of derived geometry is just to think about always resolving complicated objects by sort of um, simpler objects, for example, free modules or unconstrained fields that's a way you can think about it. That's the same roughly as being free over functions on space time, um, together with the differential. And to regard those things up to a notion of equivalence, which comes from sort of quasi isomorphism, those things should be regarded as the same if they have the same BRST cohomology. Um, and this is a pretty powerful perspective on field theory, in part because it, this is the best way we know to quantize gauge theories. Um, maybe I'll just mention that the BV formalism is roughly the same thing, but for the equations of motion rather than for the quotient by gauge symmetries. Um, another sort of advantage of this way of thinking is that it puts you very, very close to sort of um, big ideas in modern mathematics that have to do with um, homotopical algebra, the theory of L infinity algebras um, and things of that nature. Um, so with that in the back of my mind, I'd like to make the case that the pure spinner formalism is sort of a way of constructing particularly nice models of supermultiplets. So they produce models of multiplets. That are sort of naturally part of this derived context. Um, and I'll say what I mean by especially nice um, a little bit later. Um, at this point, maybe it's good to acknowledge there's been a lot of work on pure spinner superfields. This goes back to, I think, work in the context of this superstring by Berkowitz. Certainly there are earlier ideas, maybe Paul Howe is worth mentioning here. Um, and then this formalism in the context of a of a field theory, so really in the context of super multiplets, which is what I'll be talking about today, has been built up to a huge extent by Martin Sutterwall and collaborators. 
Um, so there are really numerous examples of this formalism. Um, there are very few that are new. Um, I think what's sort of perhaps different in the way that I've been th thinking about it is that one hopes to understand whether one can get every possible multiplet in this way, whether you can think of this machine for building multiplets in some sort of structured fashion. Um, I should also say, feel free to interrupt me at any point in time if there are questions, so just, just speak up. Um, So I'm going to start by speaking a little bit in generality um, about what I mean by a multiplet. Actually, let me define a couple of pieces of notation. I'll come back to that definition in just a moment. So what's the general setting in which I want to work? Um, I want to start by choosing an object that's going to play the role of the supersymmetry algebra. And I want to emphasize that I won't actually need this to be a familiar supersymmetry algebra. Every example of a familiar supersymmetry algebra will be of this type, but the formalism works more broadly. Um, so what I want is a graded Lie algebra. I'll call it P. I want that graded Lie algebra to be in degrees zero, one, and two. Um, and that's in fact all I need to ask for. So in, in the normal supersymmetric context, I would say that P0 consists of maybe Lorentz and R symmetry. P1 consists of supersymmetries. And P2 consists of translations. Um, so examples of algebras of this kind are super Poincaré algebras in any dimension and with any amount of supersymmetry. But of course, there are other examples too. Um, and the sort of super translations form a subalgebra. That's the strictly positive piece of this. It consists just of supersymmetries and translations. Um, And that subalgebra is two-step null potent. That means that it's easy to apply the exponential map. So there's kind of a technical result, which says that for null potently algebras of this kind, I can easily find a least supergroup that exponentiates them. And that least supergroup is actually diffeomorphic to T itself. I can choose the exponential map to be an isomorphism in this case. Uh, and I should think of T as really being like super space. And in particular, this, there's a sort of regular representation of the Lie algebra T. It acts on the left and the right, 
on smooth functions on the group that exponentiates t. So I'll write c infinity of t. Um, and you should think of this object as being what's typically called in the physics literature, the free superfield. What are these left and right actions? Well, those are the typical odd vector fields that you write down that represent the supersymmetry algebra. So these typically get called maybe Q alpha. And these are the sort of objects that get called chiral covariant derivatives, D alpha. Um, and those left and right actions are commuting in the sense that Q alpha with D alpha is zero. So this is all familiar stuff. There's another piece of structure floating around that I'd like to remember, um, which is that T is naturally filtered. There's a sort of chain of algebras which says that zero is contained in the translations. The translations are an abelian subalgebra. And those in turn sit inside of the super translations. Um, so the associated graded of this filtered Lie algebra is again just P1 plus P2 as an abelian Lie algebra. So that's sort of the situation I want. I've sort of said what I mean by a superspace. I've said what I mean by the action of supersymmetry on that superspace. But I want to emphasize that I have not said anything, for example, about the spin representation. Um, so far, that's not going to be important for me at all. Um, of course, if you want a physical supermultiple, you have to ask which of these constructions are relevant for a physical theory. Um, but at this moment in time, anything works in this generality. Um, so let me move on and define what I mean by pure spinner. Questions? Okay, if there are no questions, I'll move on. Well, the space of pure spinners, what I'll mean by that um, is it's just going to be the space of square zero supercharges. I'll call this space Y. And so it's the set of Qs, they're supercharges, so they live in P1. And I want to ask that bracket Q, Q is zero. Um, another way of saying that is that these are the Mark Cartan elements of that graded Lie algebra. Um, and it's important for me that I want to consider this as really being an algebraic space. So what do I mean by that? I want to say that Y is the spectrum of a particular graded ring. That graded ring uh, is first of all functions on P2. So here I'm in the symmetric algebra on the dual of P2. P2 is the translations. So if you want, you can think of this as being polynomial functions 
uh, sorry, P1 dual, my mistake. This is like polynomial functions or things generated by the coordinate functions on the space of supercharges. Um, and so that's just a polynomial ring in variables that I'll call lambda alpha. Alpha is a contragradient index to the index on the Qs, if you want to think about it that way. And then I want to quotient by the ideal that says that the supercharge at that point is square zero. So that ideal is going to be generated by equations of the form lambda alpha, lambda beta, gamma alpha beta i, where these small gammas are the structure constants. of the algebra T. Um, and I've called them gamma because in a typical super translation algebra, those are gonna be related to some gamma matrices, um, but that doesn't have to be the case here. These are just the structure constants. So I'm gonna sometimes call this ring of polynomial functions on the odd part of the Lie algebra R just for shorthand. And I'll sometimes call this ideal I. Um, so we're saying that Y isn't the algebraic space, which is the spectrum of the ring R mod I. That's just saying that R mod I is the functions on Y. Um, any questions about that? Uh, I'm, I'm a little confused about the... So those are like non-commuting non variables, right? But you take a symmetric algebra? They're commuting variables. Uh, but it's P1? I'm, I'm sorry. I'm... So P1 is just a vector space. I'll, okay. There's another way of saying why they'll be commuting. And maybe I'll come to that in just a moment. Okay. okay. Or I'll go ahead and say it now. Um, so let me point out that there's a relation Um, between R mod I, this ring that I'm defining, and the Lie algebra cohomology of T. So as you know, the Lie algebra cohomology is defined by taking the chevrolet eilenberg complex of T. That's going to be the symmetric algebra on T dual placed in degree one. So for me, a shift by minus one means placed in degree one. And then it's gonna be equipped with the chevrolet eilenberg differential. Um, the chevrolet eilenberg differential that computes Lie algebra cohomology is the dual to the bracket map. So let's see what that looks like here. Um, it's in fact going to be bigraded. The reason it's bigraded is that there's one degree coming from the homological degree in Lie algebra cohomology, and there's another degree coming from the fact that it's a graded Lie algebra. T was graded. So this looks like polynomials in variables lambda alpha. And let me call them AI. Um, with a differential of the following form, it looks like lambda alpha lambda beta, gamma alpha beta i, dda i. That's just the dual to the bracket map. But as you know, I have to think about the fields, the objects in Lie algebra cohomology, they're like ghosts. So they have the opposite parity to the symmetries they represent. Um, that's because of this shift in the homological degree by one. So if I want the by degree uh, of lambda alpha, well, lambda alpha has internal degree minus one because it's dual to a degree one symmetry and homological degree one. AI, well, it's dual to something in T2, 
So it has internal degree minus two, duality flips things, right? And homological degree one. Um, so the sort of overall degree, oops, uh, is zero for lambda and minus one for AI. Um, and the thing that determines the parity is the total degree here. In fact, if I work out what the zeroth cohomology of T is, it's precisely with respect to the totalized degree now, it's C adjoint lambda alpha. Those are the elements of degree zero quotiented by the image of the differential, which is I. So this is the object I was calling or mod I. Um, is, that, is that helpful? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, any other questions at this point? Okay. Um, so what else is there to say about the space Y? It's closely related to Lie algebra cohomology. There's an obvious sense in which it classifies possible twists of a theory with this supersymmetry. Remember that to take the twist of a theory, I choose a square zero supercharge, and then I take its cohomology by adding that supercharge to the BRST differential of the theory. Um, in order to be able to do that, I need to pick something of square zero, and the space of choices that I have is precisely the space Y, basically by definition. Um, in particular, that means it has an interesting stratification. by sort of remembering which type of twist I'm talking about or how many surviving translations there are in a given twist. And uh, the minimal stratum is always related to the space of Cartan pure spinners. if T is a normal super translation algebra. So that's in some sense where the name um, pure spinner came from. It's in general, not really the most appropriate name because there are examples where P1 does not consist of the spin representation of anything. So spinner is totally out of place. And there are other examples where P1 is the spin representation, but the space Y is not the space of pure spinners. It's bigger. Um, that happens, for example, in 11 dimensional supersymmetry. Um, the first example that was studied was 10 dimensional N equals one supersymmetry. And it happens there that the space of Cartan pure spinners and the space of square zero supercharges are precisely the same. So the sort of naming comes from that. I think this is often a confusing point. In what dimension was that 10? Or... Exactly, in 10 dimensional n equals one supersymmetry. Okay, thanks. Maybe I would have short questions. Uh, questions, please, what, what, what's the stratification, please? Um, so a way you can think about it is that the space Y has an action by Lorentz and R symmetry. It's defined as part of uh, a subspace of P1, the vector space P1. P1 is a representation of Lorentz and R symmetry and the equations are equivariant. The ideal respects that symmetry. Um, so you could think, for example, about stratifying it by the orbits of Lorentz and R symmetry, 
that would be one way to say where this comes from. Um, another would be to say that a given twist, so if I pick a square zero supercharge, it kills some number of translations, but that number might be different depending on the twist. And so there's sort of qualitatively different types of twists depending on how many translations survive or what fraction of the Lorentz symmetry is preserved. Um, you could also think about the stratification as telling you what type of twist you're talking about. Is it holomorphic, topological? What kind of topological twist? Yeah, interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any other questions at this point? Okay, so if not, maybe I'll move on briefly. Um, so I wanna point out the following thing. In general, when we consider a twist of a supersymmetric theory, um, we break the R symmetry and the Lorentz symmetry because we've chosen a particular square zero supercharge. Um, and that means that the resulting twisted theory um, doesn't have an action of the entire P zero, but just of the stabilizer of that supercharge. Um, of course, that stabilizer could be big enough that there's still a whole copy of the Lorentz group inside of it. And that's where these twisting homomorphisms come from. It means that I changed the action of the Lorentz symmetry to be along this unbroken copy that survives inside of the stabilizer. Um, but it's in general true that I break part of P zero by taking a twist. Um, even if a twisting homomorphism can be chosen to sort of patch it up after the fact. What I could do though, um, and this is sort of by definition of what the space Y is, it's the space of possible twists. So twists of any theory or even module for the algebra T, um, they fit together into a natural family over the space Y. Um, and this is even an algebraic family in some vague sense. How do I think about that family? Well, I can take the trivial bundle over the space Y whose fiber over every point is a copy of that module. And then each point in the family represents a twisting supercharge that I could add to that theory. So over the point Q, I twist the theory by the supercharge Q. So in that sense, it's like the tautological bundle construction over a projective space or any of these sort of natural universal families. Um, how is that universal family defined? Well, if I take a module M, now I wanna take a bundle whose sections, uh, sorry, the sections of the trivial bundle, right? That'll be obtained just by tensoring over C with functions on Y. Um, so I can think about functions valued in M as just functions tensored with M. That's the thing I can do. Um, now, if D alpha is the odd vector field on M, which represents a given supercharge, then the thing I'm supposed to do is I'm supposed to take the differential, which deforms the differential on M by D alpha over the point, over the corresponding point. So what do I do? I take the coordinates lambda alpha and I contract them with the operators D alpha. Um, a collection of coordinates lambda represents a fixed supercharge. And this is saying that that supercharge acts in the fiber over that point. So that's a way of writing down this family. Um, and this is sort of a tautological scalar 
square zero differential. Um, it's a scalar because in a sense, now I'm not making any choice at all. Um, rather than picking a point in this family, which is acted on by Lorentz and R symmetry, I'm considering the whole family of all possible twists. And so I never broke Lorentz or R symmetry in, at all. So what's the whole trick of the pure spinner formalism? It's to apply this construction to the free superfield. M equals C infinity of T. Remember, we constructed this thing above, and you should just think of it as being the normal free superfield that you're used to seeing. So that means that I'm writing down an object. Um, I'm going to call this object a bullet. It looks like the free superfield tensored over the complex numbers with R mod I. And it has a differential which looks like lambda alpha d alpha. And of course, now d alpha is the familiar sort of chiral covariant derivative. So at least roughly speaking, this thing is lambda alpha d d theta alpha minus plus or minus. I'm not being careful about that. Lambda beta gamma alpha beta i d d x i. So that differential is the sum of two terms. Um, and there's sort of a key point. We had two actions of supersymmetry on the free superfield. That was what made it special. The Qs commuted with the Ds. The Qs are therefore unbroken. Uh, and that means that whatever this chain complex is, a bullet comma d. Um, so let me introduce the notation d for lambda alpha d alpha. This object is a supermultiplier. Now, of course, this thing is gigantic compared to the sort of normal way of thinking about a supermultiplet. This contains lots of copies of the free superfield. In fact, infinitely many, because the ring R mod I is typically infinite dimensional as a vector space. Um, however, most of what's going on in here will be BRST trivial. So if you like, this is just a very, very huge model of a particular supermultiplet that I could have written down in components. And I'll tell you how to pass to sort of a component field description in just a moment. Um, but remember from this sort of BRST or BV perspective, I don't really care that this model is big. It represents the same object. Um, and it may be that all of that BRST trivial stuff in here has some advantage. Maybe that this has a better property compared to the sort of standard component field way of writing things. Um, so, so there can, I, can I have a question before you proceed? Um, so, mm -hmm. so when you're considering this whole space of uh, um, twists of your of your theory, mm -hmm. um, they they like some of them have quite different nature from from the other ones, right? I'm I'm talking about like having topological twists versus mm -hmm. homomorphic twists or some combined mixed twists. How, Absolutely. Uh, so, I mean, they, they, they give rise to totally different uh, types of spectra, right? Like, like how, do you, how can you treat them all together like that? How come you can just, you know, uh, like when, when I do topological twist, I, I kill almost everything, right? Whereas in those right. partial twists, I, I'm keeping a lot more stuff. How come it all like works together so nicely? I, I guess it's a big question, sorry. Uh, so... In a sense, um, I think it's a reasonable question. 
Mm, I mean, one, one vague answer might be that by building the family, so you notice that, that by taking the free super field, right, I'm preserving an independent action of the super translations everywhere. Um, and so in fact, what that's gonna lead to is that the thing I end up with is, is not um, twisted at all. I sort of twisted using the right action in all possible ways, but that's sort of not different than if you want imposing chiral constraints. You know, I could, um, I could ask that a super field is a free super field, but in the kernel of all of the chiral covariant derivatives or something like that. Mm -hmm. Now, if I asked that for the physical supersymmetries, I would be restricting to some set of operators. I'd be looking at the chiral ring or, you know, I would be somehow constraining what's going on in my theory. And the chiral ring doesn't depend on translations or anything. Um, but when I build the chiral superfield by using the Ds to do this, I end up with something that's just a superfield. The translations act sort of normally and all the derivative modes are still in there. Um, so that's maybe one, one sort of hand-waving answer. Um, I guess another thing you might say is that because I'm sort of, I mean, this, this space Y, right? It's, as you say, it has lots of different strata where things sort of jump wildly. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it's maybe not that helpful to think of this family as a vector bundle. It, it's maybe better to think of it just as abstractly defined by this chain complex um, where I'm taking, what is this sort of saying? It's saying, this is the free super field. Um, this is sort of many, many different copies shifted in homological degree. So this is if you want the basis of some huge free module. And then this object is just a differential on that chain complex of free superfields. Um, I guess the third answer would be to show you how this becomes a normal multiplet. And I'll, I'll get to that in just a moment. Thanks. Yeah. May I also ask some very basic uh, questions? Please. Uh, so, so first of all, this is M. Uh, M is generally like a module over this D algebra. Is that correct? This mm -hmm. is, it's a graded module and it, it carries a differential. Uh, it doesn't have to be, it has to be a Z2 graded module, but in fact, it doesn't end up having to be a graded module. Okay, okay. And so, uh, so, um, and so then uh, this R mod I, so this was your Y, right? Mm -hmm, that's is functions. It smooth, is it a smooth uh, like scheme or? No, it, in fact, it's never smooth, right? Because it's, okay. um, it's conical, right? It's the cone over some projective variety because R mod I is graded. Okay, oh, I see, I see, so it's not, okay. And this stratification, so I mean, do you have some like simple example like? Uh... Oh, absolutely, yeah. So um, maybe let me give some examples. Yeah. Um, so here's one, let's do 60 and equals one comma zero supersymmetry. Mm -hmm. So then P1 is the tensor product of two spaces. One is the chiral spin representation of the um, Lorentz group. So the Lorentz group is SO6, which is the same as SU4. Mm -hmm. The chiral spinner is the defining representation. So this is a C4. And then there's a symplectic R symmetry. Um, um, so if you want, there's an SP1R that acts here. Mm -hmm. um, now what's the bracket? bracket between two such objects. Um, well, it takes the wedge product of two things in the spin representation. That's actually just isomorphic to the vector representation, right? That's the, the two form of SU4 is the vector of SO6. So it's just wedging here. And it's symplectically contracting on C2, which is the same as wedging, because C2 is, of course, just a two-dimensional vector space, there's only one anti-symmetric thing you can do. Um, so square zero supercharges, 
our rank one two by four matrices with respect to this decomposition. Um, and that means it's, as a space, it's the cone. So I, if I took the projectivization, uh, I would get P1 times P3, the sort of segue embedding of P1 times P3, where the first P1 represents the vector, you know, a two by four matrix, which is rank one, is the tensor product of a four dimensional vector and a two dimensional vector up to scaling. So those each determine a line. One is a line in C2 and one is a line in C4. So that's P1 times P3. Um, okay. And why, so why why is it uh, why do you take like why don't you take this uh, pro, pro, just the projective space? Uh, I mean, or... so I, I could sort of reformulate everything in terms of the projective space, um, but then I would have to talk about proj instead of spec, right? So this it's important that sort of every graded piece of R mod I appears in this complex A. And so in terms of the projective space, of course I could talk about doing that, but then I would have to say, well, I twist by every line bundle ON and I take all of the sections of all of those bundles together. And from my perspective, it's easier to just talk about spec then. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. But like everything really is just about the graded ring R mod I. You can think about it that way. And then the geometric picture where I say I'm interested in proj R mod I or spec R mod I, I can put that in on top, but it, it's enough to think algebraically. So then you take kind of like a family over this space, uh, mm -hmm. so like R over I. So you have this stratification, so so different twists like R fibers in this family. And, and you have some like universal differential for all of them. Uh, Correct. Labeled yeah. by these uh, coordinates on this uh, Y. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Yes, yeah, I was just wanted to make sure that I understand. Okay. Yeah, no, that's that's exactly right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and there are other examples. I mean, effectively every example in a supersymmetry algebra is known. Mm -hmm. They're interesting spaces. Um, I think we wrote them all down in this paper, the first paper with Johannes. Mm -hmm. um, so there, there's a little bit more about the geometry there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Um, so just to check in quickly, are, will we go until five after the hour or? What's the typical? Uh, you can continue and uh, exceed the time over. I think uh, we started uh, five minutes after. I think, I guess we started at five past, so I'll, I'll try to end by five past. Yeah, yeah. So feel That's free to, to continue. Um, okay, so I could give I could give other examples of these things if necessary. Um, right, so there are sort of as people are pointing out, there are two key conceptual things. One is that any module over the supersymmetry algebra sort of determines a universal family of its twists, which has some canonical square zero differential. Didn't matter what M was to say that. But if M happens to be the free superfield, then it has two compatible actions of supersymmetry. And I can do this to the right action without breaking the left action. So then the resulting object, whatever it is, actually represents some supermultiply. Um, so maybe this is a good point to say, how could I compare this to a normal supermultiply? I, I run this machine, I produce some object. This object is some gigantic model of a supermultiplet, it has several advantages. One advantage is that it's actually free over superspace. Um, so it's not just resolved freely over the space time. It's not merely a BV or a BRST theory, but it's like a it's like a free superspace resolution of this multiplet. And so related to that, the way that the supersymmetry acts is just purely geometrically. It's by the left invariant vector fields on superspace. Um, and in particular, I don't have to worry about what often happens in a component BV or PRST theory is that the supersymmetry acts by some homotopy module structure, um, meaning that it acts up to gauge symmetry and then there are higher order terms 
that correct for that fact explicitly. Um, so in general, the best I have is an L infinity module structure for the supersymmetry algebra. Here, it's just a strict module. And it's kind of like a strict module in a geometric way. Um, and in this case that I've written down, there's actually one additional feature, which is surprising, which is that a bullet actually has a commutative algebra structure. Graded commutative algebra structure. So it's not only a free resolution over superspace, free resolution over superspace. Um, and I could use that structure, for example, to start defining a Lie bracket on this object. If I tensored it with a, any Lie algebra, I'd now get some DG Lie algebra. Um, so that commutative structure is sometimes useful. Okay, so now we've got this object. We don't know which multiplet it represents. How could I think about that? Well, we pointed out above. Sorry, one more question. Um, Please, yeah. Um, how is it free resolution if you tensor with that R mod I, which is not free? Or I, I guess you're... you're... If you think of R mod I, right, it's a very big complex vector space and it's free as a complex vector space. And I'm tensoring not over R, but over C. Mm -hmm. um, so the thing I have is free as a module over functions on super space. Um, okay. Okay. It's, it's a good question because of course it's not free over R and it turns yeah. out that resolving it to make it free over R uh, does something very nice. So let me come to that. Let me come to that now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thank you. Um, so we pointed out above that T has a filtration. Uh, and in fact, this filtration determines a filtration on all of A. Um, let me not go into the details of how that works. It's sort of everything in A. Um, the only thing that went into my construction was the Lie algebra T. So filtration on T determines a filtration everywhere if I want. And the associated graded object is then, of course, the same thing as a commutative algebra. It's just C infinity on T tensored over C with R mod I. Um, but the differential is now just lambda DD theta. So taking the associated graded just threw away the second term in my differential. And you'll notice that the second term is the only one that touched the space time at all. So the space time coordinates are X, the sort of super space coordinates are theta, and then the lambdas are these pure spinner coordinates that generate R mod I. Um, and once I've taken the associated graded, um, the differential is just purely something algebraic. It plays with the thetas and the lambdas, but not with the x's. So in other words, this thing is isomorphic to C infinity on P2. So that's just smooth functions on space time. tensored with a vector space. Um, so really, I mean, if I'm being careful about the Lorentz and R symmetry, I should say this object is the sections of the bundle associated to a representation of Lorentz symmetry. And that representation of Lorentz symmetry is determined in a purely algebraic fashion just by the following complex. Well, I take R mod I, I adjoin the variables theta alpha to it, and then I equip that with the differential lambda alpha dd theta alpha. So what this object is, is this is sometimes called the complex computing Kazool homology. 
of R mod I. Um, what I've done is I've sort of, for every bosonic generator lambda, I've adjoined a fermionic generator theta. And then I've put in a sort of differential that wants to be a cyclic. It says the fermion maps to the corresponding boson. So if the ideal were not here, this thing would have no interest in cohomology at all. It would just cancel the lambdas against the thetas. Um, but because the ideal is there, that doesn't quite work. And there is interest in cohomology here. So let's think about how we would compute that cohomology. Um, which determines the sort of um, set of component fields. of the multiplet. Well, the easiest way to do it is to sort of resolve R mod I freely over R. That means that we replace R mod I by a complex of better behaved objects, which are free R modules together with a differential such that the cohomology of that object is R mod I in degree zero and zero everywhere else. Um, so then I get a great big bi-complex, which looks like the following. It looks like L bullet. I adjoin variables theta alpha everywhere. And I have the differential lambda alpha dd theta alpha plus dl. If I take the cohomology of DL first, I recover the thing I wanted to compute in the first place. So I know I'm computing the right thing by considering this bike complex. That spectral sequence proves that I'm still writing the thing I wanted. But if I take the cohomology of this canceling differential first, well, everything in Albula is a free R module. So I just get a copy of the ground field, just a copy of the identity for every generator of that free R module. And if it was a minimal free resolution, DL can't do anything after that. So minimal means that DL always contains variables. It has no constant terms. Once the variables have been set to zero, that means that DL acts by zero on the remaining vector space. So the object I get is just the object obtained by replacing every copy of R in the resolution L bullet with a copy of C, killing all the lambdas. At least if L bullet DL was minimal. Um, So that tells me that there's a really nice way of understanding the sort of component fields or the minimal set of component fields. I, I, I hesitate to say the component fields because really part of the lesson is that you could have whatever set of component fields you wanted, or you could always make it bigger by choosing a different model. Um, but the sort of smallest possible set is gonna be obtained by running this procedure, and it's gonna look like the set of generators of a minimal free resolution of R mod I over the polynomial rank R. Um, so there's a well-known example, which probably people have seen before. If I take 10 dimensional N equals one supersymmetry, uh, and I take L bullet tensored over R with C. This is a bi-graded object. It's graded once because R was a graded ring and it's graded twice because L has a cohomological degree. It looks like a copy of the field in degree zero, copy of the vector representation of SO10 in by degree one comma one a copy of the chiral spin representation and by degree one comma two, a conjugate spinner here, two comma three, 
another vector in three comma four, and another copy of the grand field in degree four comma five. And so if I write this as a bundle, if I take the associated bundle, I get something that looks like zero forms, one forms, chiral spinners, another copy of chiral spinners. And then I'm going to call this nine forms and this 10 forms. Um, and that looks very much like the component fields of the BV description of the 10 dimensional Yang Mills multiplet. So here's a gauge field. It has a gauge invariance coming from a ghost. It's an abelian gauge invariance, but that's fine. Then I've got a spinner, and then I have sort of anti fields to all of that. Um, now, of course, that's not a super multiplet yet. I need to include the other terms in the differential. So it has further terms. by the piece I left out. So the piece I left out looked like uh, this. It involved space-time derivatives. And if I work out what those new terms are, there's an algorithmic way of doing this. And I get the following things. I get the Duram operator. I get a copy of the Dirac operator here. And then at higher order in the resulting spectral sequence, I get precisely um, Maxwell's equation for the gauge field sitting here. So the object I get is in fact precisely the free BV theory that is abelian 10 dimensional n equals one super Yang Mills. Um, of course, it's resolved in this gigantic fashion, um, but that resolution, let me just finish with one or two remarks. That resolution was multiplicative. And so that means if I wanted to introduce interactions, I need to think about an sort of L infinity algebra structure on this object. Recall that in the BV formalism, the data of the interactions is the same as the data of an L infinity structure on the shift by one of the fields. Um, and I further claim that if I tensored the commutative algebra structure up stairs with the Lie algebra G, and I transferred the resulting L infinity algebra to this smaller description, I would get precisely the interactions of 10 dimensional n equals one super Yang Mills theory. So this sort of big model has not only the effect that the action of supersymmetry is strictified, it's made much simpler. Um, also the interactions get simpler because the quartic vertices are sort of eliminated. They only get introduced when you integrate out all this BRST trivial stuff. Um, okay, so I'm, I'm a bit over, but I'd like to maybe close with one small remark. Um, so, so far I didn't tell you how to do this. I just gave you a way that takes a supersymmetry algebra and it spits out a single multiplet. So if I, here I could have started with the 10 dimensional n equals one supersymmetry algebra and I could have run this machine. And the claim is that at the end, I would have gotten a Boolean 10 dimensional n equals one super Yang Mills theory. And I also said that I could do this for any super Lie algebra, at least of the appropriate form. But what I didn't tell you is how to get many different multiplets for the same supersymmetry algebra. Um, and to do that, I wanna go up to this construction. Um, I claim this construction is actually better than just this universal family. Um, you'll notice that I actually could have included any sheaf over the space Y here. All I need is a module where R mod I acts. That's actually enough to build a complex of this form that has all the same properties. It won't necessarily have a commutative algebra structure. Um, I could replace R mod I by any appropriate, so equivariant R mod I module. 
So that means that this machine is actually something better than just a way of producing a single multiplet. It takes the input of a sheaf or a module over this totally algebraic ring, and it spits out a multiplet. Um, and in fact, you can use it to produce any multiplet that you've heard of and many more besides. Um, so for reasons of time, I'm gonna stop there, um, but I'm happy to stick around for questions. Thanks for your attention. Yeah, thank you very much for a nice uh, contribution. And uh, now I encourage people to, to ask questions or post remarks if uh, there's any. So what are some su surprising multiples that we haven't heard of? Um, well, so if you looked at this 60n equals one example, um, that's kind of a particularly nice example because it's easy to understand, for example, line bundles um, on there. You can just take, for example, a family of line bundles labeled by a pair of integers. So take any line bundle ON over P1 and pull it back. Tensor it with the pullback of any line bundle OM over P3. That's some family of multiplets um, labeled by a pair of integers. And it includes normal ones like O00 is um, the vector multiplet in this case. I think something like O10 or O20 is the hypermultiplet. Um, O11 maybe or O13, something like that. Uh, let me not be too specific. You can get the anti field multiplet for the vector multiplet. But then you start getting strange ones and you can write down, Fabian Hanner wrote a bunch of these down. I think all of them, um, there's sort of a general formula for what the resolutions of those look like. And you get some funny infinite collection of multiplets with larger and larger R symmetry representations. Um, and I don't really know what to make of that. I mean, they have a tensor product structure, right? So you could imagine trying to start writing down interactions by saying, I want to somehow tensor sheaves with their ser dual sheaves or insert appropriate operators. Um, like, I think, I think ultimately the philosophy that I'm trying to push is that you should try to understand everything about multiplets by just thinking about the category of sheaves on this space. Um, and trying to use natural structures on those sheaves. So like commutative structures or least structures to produce L infinity structures on these great big resolutions. And I mean, there's sort of hope that like using that family of multiplets in 60, um, you could get some exotic collection of theories. I don't, I can't say anything much more concrete than that. But, but have these uh, exotic multiplets maybe been um, left out of the physics literature because they have higher spins? Is that maybe the rule of thumb? Uh, so I think often that's the case. I mean, th there are cases where you end up reproducing something that's called like a current multiplet or like a field strength multiplet or like a stress tensor multiplet. Those, they're sort of examples of those in the old literature. Um, you sort of don't expect that many of these to be relevant to writing down theories because of this higher spin thing. I mean, I guess I would say that's the reason that probably most of these were ignored, but it's sort of nice to have a systematic perspective where you could say, now I have some hope of understanding every multiplet because I have this machine, which actually wants to be an equivalence of categories. Um, and so if I understand the category of equivariant sheaves well enough on P1 times P3, that's like a very classical algebraic geometry kind of problem. Um, then maybe you could say something exhaustive about the category of multiplets for that supersymmetry algebra. I mean, that would be kind of, kind of one thing you might hope to do. Oh, I don't think I've done that. I ask you, so what, what happens if I take the, like the skywriter sheaves in, at some point, like a, just? A... Well, so the, the sheaf has to be equivariant, 
right? It, it has to be compatible with the Lorentz and R symmetry action. Okay. So usually, usually there won't be, the only equivariant skyscraper sheaf is gonna be kind of at the cone point at the origin. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And if you do that, you go back to this construction, you're sort of just sticking in the ground field instead of R mod I with the sort of obvious um, R mod I module structure that kills all the variables. They all act by zero. Mm -hmm. And so what you get there is the differential is zero and you get the free superfield back. Mm -hmm. So there's, the, there's a universal statement that says that to get the free superfield as a module, you just take the skyscraper sheaf at the cone point. And that's sort of like not imposing any constraints. Um, because this, like the support of this sheaf is roughly telling you which constraints you impose and how. Um, so that, that sheaf is like throwing them all away and you just get back the skyscraper sheaf. Um, what you could do is you could ask about like push forwards of, you could ask about like push forwards of structure sheaves of, of orbits or strata. Those will be equivariant sheaves and you get interesting things there. Um, so maybe inspired by that question, how do you zero in on a particular twist in this formalism? Uh, me meaning that like having constructed a multiplet, how do I ask what its twist is? Uh, right. So like if you want to twist at a certain squares at a particular square zero supercharge. Great. And understand the properties of that twist. Great. Yeah. So this, if I had had time, I would have gotten to this because this is, this is something I thought about with Brian. Um, so the thing we're doing is sort of working uniformly over the space of all possible twists. But as, as John points out, I could ask, given a multiplet, like suppose I wanted to compute the twist of 10 dimensional n equals one Yang Mills theory. Um, so this object, there's only one twist there and it's sort of the holomorphic twist. Um, so it turns out, and this is a theorem, um, that taking Q cohomology In other words, twisting actually commutes with this whole procedure. So what does that mean? That means if I wanted to compute the twist with respect to a fixed Q, of the multiplet that I get out of this untwisted supersymmetry algebra. Let me just talk about the structure sheaf. What I could instead do is take bracket Q, uh, view that as a differential on P, take the cohomology of that differential. That's some new algebra called PQ which is sort of the algebra of residual supersymmetry in the twisted theory, but it still fits the, you know, it still obeys these constraints from the beginning. It's still supported in degrees zero, one, and two. And so I can ask what multiplet is associated to PQ by this procedure. Um, and it turns out that the multiplet associated to PQ is the Q twist of the multiplet associated to P. So geometrically, Oh, nice way to think about that is that um, it's like zooming in around the point, like the, the untwisted thing is like considering a neighborhood of zero. Because this space has a C star action, it's conical. Really the entire geometry is about the geometry of the singularity at the origin. And if I wanna consider the Q twist, Geometrically, that means that I'm looking at um, sort of a infinitesimal or formal neighborhood of the point Q rather than the point zero. Um, and I could take the sheaf that I'm interested in, pull it back to that neighborhood, and then up to a certain sort of homotopy equivalence. Um, the thing that I get just comes from sort of what the sheaf is doing near the twisting supercharge 
so that's I see that as being actually a big another big advantage of this formalism is that before it was sort of laborious to compute the twist. You, you would have to sort of write down the multiple and components, decide what the homotopy action of supersymmetry is, manually throw things away. And now you can sort of compute the twist by just doing a computation in a finite dimensional Lie algebra, and then doing a little bit of, you know, freely resolving some pretty simple commutative ring. Um, so it takes like a couple of minutes now. Um, I have examples of that, but I, I don't wanna just sort of randomly start talking about something different. <laughs> So is there any other questions? Maybe one, one small question uh, about <laughs> that uh, extra term. Uh, uh, I, I didn't quite get how you introduced that or um, how does that occur? In the in differential, the you mean? Yeah, yeah, the, the one you, you wrote down uh, before the red writing. Uh, so this, let's see, this term here. Right, yeah. yeah. So remember that when we defined this object, a, uh, it had a differential that was naturally the sum of two terms. Mm -hmm. And what we're sort of interested in doing is we're interested in describing the cohomology of A or the homotopy type of A, like the equivalence class of A, um, by finding some smaller model. And to find that smaller model, we're, we're sort of, you can think of it as a spectral sequence computation where we first take the cohomology of this bit that gives us. Um, a finite dimensional vector bundle over space time. And then we have to take the cohomology of the induced differential coming from this bit that introduces sort of first order differential operators. Those first order differential operators in this picture are gonna be here, the Durham differential, so that linearized gauge invariance and the Dirac equation. But because it's a spectral sequence, it might not stop there. It might have higher order differentials and sort of the differentials on each page are gonna go up and up in the order of differential operator that appears just because more differential operators come in every time I go through a zigzag with two of those new differentials. So on, on the E2 page, then I sort of get this thing, which is an order two differential operator. Um, and then it actually stops. So in a sense, the claim is that the chain complex here, when I equip it with this differential, is then quasi-isomorphic to the original one, just with the tautological differential D. I see. But, but Imar, I think there's, there's a typo in the original differential. Uh, maybe. Yeah, there was no That's theta, right? But, uh, but... Uh, sorry, there should be a theta. Thank you. Uh, these, so these and the alpha and the beta are flipped. So it's it's important that it's lambda alpha contracted with something. Mm. That something is the operator d alpha, and the d alpha has a theta beta in it contracted with kappa. So that this is now the correct formula. Sorry about that. Thanks. Thanks. So maybe just a quick question. So, uh, so you are talking about like assigning uh, like uh, multiples to sh to sheaves. So, mm -hmm. so what about the morphisms of the sheaves? So, is there like an advantage that you can talk about? That's that's a great question. Um, so there's there's kind of an there's kind of an obvious sense in which I can view this as a functor. Um, because really what I'm doing when I do this is I'm tensoring with a particular bimodule. Mm -hmm. um, and that bimodule is just the free superfield tensored with this thing. Um, and I, you know, really, I didn't say this yet, but the, the bimodule that I want to think about, um, write it down here. I want to think of this as the functor. Which is tensoring. With the bimodule. module. 
c infinity of t tensored with um, actually something slightly bigger than OY, I want to take the Lie algebraic cochains of T. And I claim there's an extension of the tautological differential here, which is just the one that, um, you know, puts the right module structure on C infinity of T. And then this is just the, the differential for Lie algebraic cohomology with coefficients in that right module. Um, and the claim is that this thing is actually quasi isomorphic to C. So this is like a bimodule tensoring with which does not do anything. So it's like contractible in a way. Um, and if I have a C bullet of T module, then this machine will spit out um, something that's a multiplet, like it's like over superspace and which has a left action by supersymmetry. And then if I go backwards, um, well, I just tensor again. Um, and so there, there's kind of a, there's a sense in which this whole procedure is really, really close to a Kazool duality construction. Um, the difference being that this thing is not quite U of T. It's closely related, but it's not exactly the same. Um, yeah, so this, this sort of forthcoming work or this future work that I mentioned with Fabian Hanner and Chris Elliott is kind of precisely trying to pin down some of the details of that. But, but you should sort of imagine that this thing wants to be something better than just a procedure. It wants to be an equivalence of appropriate derived categories. It wants to say that, you know, like multiplets up to after I invert quasi-isomorphisms um, are the same as maybe like DG modules, DGC bullet of T modules. Um, but let me let me be vague about the details because I don't think I fully understand them yet. Yeah, thank you. So any other question? It seems that there is no other. So thanks to the speaker again. Thanks very much. I'm very delighted. Uh, yeah, it was a pleasure. Accept, uh, the invitation and uh, yeah, nice, uh, very so nice talk. Next time, hopefully, we will see you in person. I hope so too. Yeah. I hope so too. Yeah. Yeah, thanks so much, everybody. Yeah. Is there a seminar next week? Yeah. Yeah, th there should be. Uh, but. Uh, yeah, it's a guest of Roman.